Hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar on autism and music. Um, I would like to first thank you for joining. Um, I will introduce myself, I'll be your moderator for uh, today and my name is Mansa. I'm a psychology research master student in Amsterdam, but I'm also part of the organizations that have made this event happen. Um, I'm part of the uh, Brain Awareness Week organization theme that's part of Synapsa, Slovenian neuroscience organization, and I'm also uh, collaborating with the BR, uh, which is a Creative Europe project um, that is also part of uh, Radio Television Slovenia. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone that are also part of these teams that have helped me organize this event, either by creating materials, um, promoting it, and the technical support as well. Um, but especially uh, thank you to the speakers that have generously offered their time and experience and are sharing it with us today. Um, and before I introduce each speaker, I would like to give uh, give everyone a little overview of how this event is going to go. We'll follow three short lectures, first starting with Katarina, who will showcase the methods she collected and developed through the past decade, teaching and communicating through piano play with youth with autism spectrum disorder. Next, we'll explore the research findings on the unique aspects of musical engagement with these individuals with autism spectrum disorder and the utilization of music interventions to enhance various aspects of their skills and their well being. And uh, we'll invite Brianna to do this and explain um, because she's recently written a comprehensive review of research on this field. Uh, she will also lead us through her work on applying various research practices in marginalized communities. And lastly, Supritha will also talk about um, using artistic practices and how they can support children with ASD and share her own practices, including dance therapy. Um, yes, I'm really excited to share their, uh, for us to, to listen to their experiences and their knowledge. Um, and I would like to ask the listeners to prepare their questions or already put them in the Q&A box that you have at the bottom of the screen um, or in the chat. You can also ask your questions in Slovene and I will do my best to translate. Um, and yeah, in the end, we'll join in a little, um, I will join in the discussion with all the speakers where I will translate your questions to them. And um, yeah, um, we'll see um, how it goes. And but yeah, feel free to already put questions in during their lectures. Um, yes, yeah, so that's it. Um, again, thank you for joining, and I hope you enjoy. Um, and I'll already uh, just give the floor to our first speaker, Katarina. Um, Katarina is a musician, music teacher, and composer with a master's degree in musicology. And for more than 15 years, she's been teaching piano, music theory, singing. She organizes music workshops for preschool children and has also been working with children with autism spectrum disorder. And she explores these new teaching methods that would make learning piano and music itself more therapeutic, more effective and more enjoyable. She's also researching the impact of musical involvement on children's development and creates musical material for more enjoyable learning for both neurotypical and neurodivergent children. She's currently employed at the school Centro Novo Misto, where she teaches music subjects at the Secondary School of Construction, Wood Technology and Preschool Education. Um, yes, Katarina, we're really happy to have you and um, listen about your experiences and your knowledge. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh Thank you, Mansa, for invitation. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Um, so, um, as Mansa said, um, I will show you some examples of how I tailored my teaching methods, what was useful and what not. <laughs> that was my path, my way. Um, but I hope you'll get some useful ideas and that the presentation will appeal to you. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will also present positive effects of musical involvement. 
uh, that I and student, uh, students' uh, parents uh, noticed. So uh, let me start with my presentation. Okay. Oops. Oh, I'm so sorry. From the start. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so to begin, I will present some general, I can say, um, tips uh, for teaching children with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, these are tips that I've learned from experience and some I've gotten um, myself when I started teaching. Um, these are first, each child is different and each day is different. So not every method um, is for every child. And also not every method is for every day, for the same child. So if um, keep trying, keep changing methods, some, some days it will be good, some days not, and not for, for all. Then give clear instructions, um, clear explicit instructions with clear voice. So use clear uh, verbal instructions and allow time from, for them to proceed. Uh, if it is possible, it represents concepts with um, visual cards or visual is something like that. Um, so then establish a routine. That's really important. I noticed that if you identify each step uh, for lesson, it's um, more uh, comfortable. So it's for stability and comfort and they can learn, uh, they knew what's next and what we already crossed. Uh, then here's uh, create um, environment that is um, it's um, orderly, and that, that there's no distractions, there's no noise um, without any artificial sound or light and like that. So they can focus. And uh, here's also focus on one thing at a time. So if you want to um, put, for example, first finger on the this note, that's enough, not um, now left hand, right hand, everything um, at once. So then um, important is note reading is not the most important thing uh, I learned hard way. <laughs> but yes, important is that they learn, that they um, enjoy music, that they uh, um, listen, communicate through music. So let them do that. Note reading is something that come. Um, then open and honest communication with the parents. It's important to, to know your student, to understand um, him or she, so you can uh, find some methods and interests that are for them. And be patient, that's most important. Uh, patience is here for every student, <laughs> if you uh, wanna read something. Um, when I started to teach, uh, I didn't know exactly how to approach a, a student with uh, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, how to make piano lessons effective and also fun. Um, so my beginnings were uh, exploratory. I think they still are, uh, to be honest. Every student is different. So every time I have a new student, um, it's necessary to spend a lot of time observing and adjusting methods. So first observing, observing and identifying um, new ways to communicate with children uh, while also bringing them joy and enhance their well-being, cognitive, motor, motor and social emotional skills. Then it's important to observe, to write down um, the progress, uh, impact of musical involvement, uh, then exploring the use of innovative technical um, teaching methods for piano lessons. Uh, you should write behavior, um, impact and everything down. Um, then how to find the right uh, teaching method. Um, it's important to, to observe the child during the lesson recording if it is possible. Uh, their progress, their behavior, as I said, then uh, used, use, using collected information to develop no, new uh, techniques uh, for each child's individual strengths and interests. So it is important to know ch child, um, so to, to have communication with their parents and to um, understand and know him better. 
and then to ask yourself um, in the end of every lesson which techniques and tools have been uh, most beneficial to the child's progress, uh, which were not, what was useful and what should we change. Uh, and here I have a research uh, pre present some teaching methods uh, that have proven for me to be the most useful and that I have uh, used the most for both neuro uh, neurotypical and neurodivergent children, also for um, preschool children. The first is, I called it a rainbow piano because everything is, is, it is in colors. Here's a um, song, Spring, uh, Vivaldi Spring. And it is, everything is colored. Um, here is also a keyboard with some stickers, colored stickers. And we use it like this. Um, first, together with the student, we determine the color that will indicate a certain tone or piano key. Uh, then we mark the tones on the keyboard with colored slips or stickers. I also used um, markers when I didn't have these stickers, but now you can also buy um, in internet um, some stickers 10 or 15 years ago there. We, we didn't have that, but now it's everything there. And then we prepare a music sheet on which the tones are marked, colored with a certain color. I use uh, crayons, uh, felty pens, markers, but now I can also use um, music programs. This is Sibelius, which you can also color colored uh, notes when you write something down. But if you have already some um, music sheet, you can color it in that's okay. Um, eventually the students associate the notes with colors and gradually also with the keys. So first, not for everyone, but after a few lessons playing by course, we add letters that indicate music notes. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And we would, when we practice, teacher can also recite and rhythm the letters. That's like, if you play one, two, three, C, E, 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 D, C, G, and like that, so that he um, or she can have feeling for rhythm. And um, sometimes I also sing, sometimes they're also singing, singing with me, and they learn um, better, so they can also learn at home. Um, one of <clears throat> methods that... Um, was, that was um, useful was also visual lesson uh, playing cards. I tried first with a whiteboard and markers and I wrote down uh, our routine, our um, what we will start with listening, then we'll sing that song, then we'll try the rhythm with clapping so that um, students have some um, lesson plan and he know that now it's we crossed we we did did that listening so we're going to the singing and like that so he or she have some routine and it's uh, comforting for them i checked nowadays you can also get similar cards on the internet also printable cards but this in pictures i made uh, myself uh, this was my first i I tried uh, in some lessons, so it's not for every uh, every student, but for some it helped. So uh, we make lesson plan and represent it to your to your students, so he she'll know what's coming next and how far they are to the lesson. Each step of lesson plan show with visual cards, or you you can also use a whiteboard and write down. Uh, then there's uh, improvisation um, in my experience, it takes quite a while for most of the students to start uh, improvise by themselves. Uh, children with um, autism spectrum disorder tend to like familiar and learned uh, structures. So you must go slowly and be patient and try it many times. But we did like that. We, we do like that. We listen to the song I previously chose and um, I teach the student main team, for example, like this uh, Vivaldi spring, la 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 la. And then um, we sing it, vocalize it, and move to the rhythm with clapping. And then we start improvising on the team we learned. And then gradually we also use our own team or something like that, or 
what a student choose. Um, here's also listening, composing, arranging, and producing. Uh, <clears throat> we listen to the song student chose. Um, the student plays by ear and invents new melodies, new har harmonies and compositions. Uh, then I record lessons if it is possible and describe what I hear. Uh, sometimes it is new songs, sometimes arrangement. Uh, then with two students, maybe I export to MIDI files and send to the students. So the student then creates his final work with the help of music production uh, programs. They have this like color for um, MIDI files and they uh, then visualizes and internalizes the composition. So we work together. Then I transcribe again and we learned uh, learn arrangement or some new composition. Um, this is some, uh, I have one example. Um, my student collected well-known songs from the early uh, 2000s and joined them together in a medley. So I'll show you a short clip how the final version is. Okay, I hope you uh, knew some of these uh, <laughs> songs. Uh, and it's, it's like that, it's about two minutes and a half and it's uh, his own uh, arrangement. Um, and then um, <clears throat> one of method with the recording and making piano tutorials for, for homework. Um, quite a few of my students had better visual memory than auditory, so I started recording uh, the process of playing songs, uh, each hand separately. Um, the videos have proven to be a very successful tool for practicing at home, so they didn't forget what we learned in a uh, lesson. And so I started with recording, with the recording one hand, here is left hand of, um, of one Disney song. It is important that um, that it's uh, that you show um, position of hand. That you show keyboard. This is tangled uh, from from tangled. I think um, I see the light uh, song. And here is right hand. So each step. Okay, like that. Um, and then later, I also discovered another way of visualizing uh, playing for home practice. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, Synthesia. It's a software, uh, piano visual visualization software. Uh, you can make um, it from, you can um, import MIDI or um, from Sibelius uh, tracks to uh, to make this um, tutorials so it's also useful because it's colorful in it shows when it but it's not for for hand you don't know how the hand should um, be in which position 
but it's also useful for, for home practicing. Um, then we also, because the letters were not so close for one student, I also tried with numbers. Um, so for some students, marking with numbers instead of letters proved to be more effective. We assign a number to each finger, the same as the note. We can use it also in combination with colors. Um, you can also use it with colored ribbons or rubber bands uh, in fingers one, two, three, like that. Um, it's also a good technique. Um, the most interesting discovery for me was communication through uh, or with music. Um, I could com communicate with some students only through music. I couldn't um, communicate with words. So one of uh, my one of students' mother said that she and her um, her daughter started practicing similarly at home. Uh, through music, they formed a special bond uh, that they didn't have before. They both uh, started playing piano, and that was their time together. Um, they sit down um, and play piano together, and something really beautiful. Uh, but how was that in my lessons? When I asked the student how her day was, she answered by sitting down at the piano and playing the piece we learned in her own way. If she was, for example, sad, she played slowly and, and uh, quiet, and I don't know, um, if when she was uh, happy, it was uh, really quick and um, fa fast and, and, and loud and like that. So I listened and observed change, change and in her be uh, playing and behavior, and over time I understand uh, new language and we started to communicate with uh, two music um, and she finds some um, some harmony, she felt better. So the music was therapeutic for, for, for her. And also today we are, uh, we're playing together and we, we start our session with not how are you, but sit down at the piano and playing the piece. Um, <clears throat> here are also, um, positive effects of musical involvement for the end. Um, first was language development. Some of my students started uh, reading um, and they start re reading, uh, read better and uh, speak um, better and more. Then improving motor skills, um, improving social skills. One of my students uh, started to go alone uh, to bus in school and uh, he could uh, send me a um, message when he couldn't come and like that. Then um, development of performance skills, they started to play for audience, speak for audience, some of them, then increasing um, concentration and persistence, then easier adaptation to unfamiliar situations and uh, um, important increasing uh, self-confidence. That was that we observed. Um, that's all for me. I hope I was not long. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Katarina. Um, that was wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing your first-hand experience. Um, I think it's very, your, wor your work is very valuable because it's, it's still like a research um, in progress. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. You um, yeah, we'll move on to Brianna now. Um, so she can also share um, the side of a researcher um, to compliment you. Um, and um, yeah, I'll introduce her first. Um, she's a philosopher, um, she's a doctor's student at the University of Oxford who recently published a review of the effects of music therapy for people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, but her research in general focuses on culturally competent therapeutic solutions for ethnic minority in the UK, namely the creative arts therapies and the exploration of these as adjunct and effective treatment methods. Um, she graduated with a master's in mental health studies from King's College London, with a thesis focusing on the uses of music for individuals with anorexia nervosa, 
In 2019, she completed a Fulbright Research Award in Berlin, Germany, and um, did so assessing the uses of narrative therapy in Syrian refugees with PTSD. Um, she has really like a broad research experience um, and is currently working on her PhD. Um, and yeah, we're really happy to have you, Brianna, and um, I'll give you the floor. Amazing. Thanks so much for the introduction, Manka, and also thanks to the AIR and University of Amsterdam for having me. I will go ahead and share my slides. There we go. Can everyone see? Amazing. Right, um, so it was kind of in the introduction, but today I'll take you through a paper that I published in 2022. Um, it was specifically a systematic review focusing on the uses of music um, and music therapy for people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, I'll also take you a bit through my PhD that I'm currently working on, and this has to do with the uses of music and, and dance and art-based therapies for different cultures and seeing if they're culturally competent solutions for different psychiatric disorders. Um, so just to start, um, this research was funded by King's College um, in conjunction with the National Institute for Healthcare and Research. So just to give a small background, um, we're all here about autism spectrum disorder, so I won't give too much of an aside, um, but ASD refers to a complex neurodevelopmental condition um, that impairs specifically behavior, communication, and social functioning. Um, the rate of incidence has shown that ASD is frequently arising during childhood, um, but it also persists through adolescence. Um, it typically becomes visible in the first five years of childhood. Um, but it also persists um, throughout a lifetime as well. Over the past 50 years, studies have confirmed that the prevalence of ASD is increasing globally. Um, the current rate of incidence has reported to be one in 160 children, um, and that's globally. And it also affects more than four times um, more men than, than women um, at present. Um, also, the National Institute for Healthcare and Research Excellence, it's called NICE here in the UK. Um, they develop the guidelines for different psychiatric disorders, um, but they recommend different psychosocial interventions for the core symptoms um, and also um, symptoms that are focused specifically on life skills and improving life overall. The prognosis, unfortunately, is not good. Um, children with ASD have shown to have poor outcomes, and only 25% of individuals show good or fair outcomes. Um, the majority of adults with, adults with ASD remain dependent on their families um, throughout their lifetime, and they often have issues um, remaining in professional um, situations, um, and also taking up formal education, maintaining employment, living independently, and things of that nature. Therefore, there is an inherent need for improved treatment outcomes and also um, therapeutic solutions that assist with recovery. So that brings me to music therapy for autism. Um, active music making, which is learning skills like, sorry, learning skills like piano, um, instrumentation, things of that nature have shown to improve um, and ASD in, in different ways, as well as receptive music making, which is engaging with listening, um, either in group or individual sessions. Um, and these have shown benefits specifically for attention, memory, and verbal communication. Music has also been shown to be a tool for enhancing interpretation and also communicating different emotions. Um, in specific studies with individuals with ASD, um, it actually promoted mind reading, specifically showing empathy um, in people with ASD versus um, individuals that didn't have any sort of engagement with music. Um, and moreover, it's been shown to just alleviate different symptoms with pain, anxiety, agitation, and also depression. So for this systematic review specifically, um, it was a total of three databases that I searched. Um, PubMed, PsychInfo, Web of Science, and this is up until February of 2022. The key search terms that I um, utilized were autism spectrum disorder, obviously, ASD, um, and also in conjunction with music and music therapy. 
So to be included within the, the search and within the actual systematic review, participants had to be diagnosed with ASD or had some symptoms of ASD um, and also studies that were relating autism with music. And they had to be experimental or observational in nature as far as study design. Those that did not include ASD related um, symptoms were excluded and those that didn't include any sort of musical intervention were excluded as well. This is just a PRISMA diagram taking you through the results. Um, so in total, there were 81 studies that met the full eligibility criteria um, and a total of almost 44,000 participants through those 81 studies. Um, the 81 studies compromise surveys, experimental studies, um, longitudinal studies, and also RCTs. And they fell specifically within four different categories, which I will take you through um, the results. So the first category um, that was determined from the 81 studies was music perception. Um, and in this specific category, it's been shown across a multitude of studies that individuals with autism had a superior ability to differentiate, differentiate different pitches. Um, so different octave changes, different key changes, um, individuals with ASD were more likely to recognize these in comparison to healthy controls. Um, and they were also reported to have a strong preference for music over verbal material. Um, so in a few studies, there were um, listening exercises with storybooks um, versus a music um, kind of listening activity. And individuals or children with autism actually responded uh, more strongly with the music intervention versus the, the, the verbal um, storytelling that was given as the second intervention. Um, music has also been shown to increase pro-social skills within this category. Um, so individuals paired with neurotypical children um, actually increased communication throughout the time that a music intervention was utilized. Um, and also individuals with AST appeared to prefer more upbeat music um, in comparison to um, you know, more slow and soft and, and soothing things of that nature. And then it's also been shown that um, individuals AS, ASD were more physiological responsive to their preferred music choices in comparison to the control group. Um, in this study by Hillier in 2016, um, individuals actually chose a piece of music before the intervention started. Um, and then they were also paired with a, a piece of music that they didn't prefer. Um, and with the music that they preferred, they had a, a larger affinity for um, enjoying it more. So the second category um, within those 81 studies was the effect of music on people with ASD. Um, specifically in this category, um, we found that music increased the emotional recognition um, within people, um, specifically in comprehension. So recognizing different emotions that would occur um, with different individuals, whether that's anger, whether that's happiness, um, joy or sadness, they were able to recognize these emotions more when music was either played in the background or played in a group setting like you see in the photo. Um, and in a, in a, in an intervention with adults, um, it was reported that individuals with ASD reported poor auditory imagery um, in comparison to healthy controls. Um, but also when music was utilized, it increased motivation to actually physically exercise. Um, so when individuals would hear a piece of music, um, they would be more motivated to engage in physical activity versus when it was silent or with a verbal intervention like hearing a story or talking. The third category is the effect of music therapy and musical training on people with autism. So there were a horde of different benefits that had been shown from this category. Specifically, um, music therapy was shown to be beneficial for the child-parent relationship. Um, also in movement coordination, social communication, attention, um, interaction, and overall the, the lessening of symptoms of autism. So an increase of social functioning, um, behavior and communication. And when active music, music making was utilized, so engaging with um, instrumentation or a, a group activity with music, um, there seem to be um, more significant improvements in social skills, specifically in children. Um, and then also on a neurological level, um, neuroplasticity um, was affected and shown to be beneficial 
and also also alleviate stress in both children and adults. The final category had a mixture of music therapy and also dance movement therapy. Um, this comprised four different studies from the 81, so it was quite a small result. But within those studies, um, it was shown that a combination of music therapy and dance movement therapy um, produced an increase in social competence um, and also a reduction in compulsive behaviors um, that are very typical with autism spectrum disorder and also an overall reduction in ASD scores. Um, in the Mateos Moreno study in 2013, they did a, um, they did a um, testing pre-intervention and also post-intervention, um, and the pre-scores were significantly higher than after the combined music therapy and dance movement therapy intervention. So autism scores had declined um, after both those interventions were utilized in conjunction. There were a few limitations to report, um, specifically for the systematic review, um, randomized control trials were limited. And so only 17 of the 81 articles um, actually were RCTs, um, and also the sample sizes were quite small. Um, the majority of studies were child dominant, um, and a few um, samples included adults. So it's hard to make um, generalizations, of course, with different age groups, um, specifically because the majority of study included child dominant samples. And also there was a lack of longitudinal studies. A lot of the um, studies took place over four weeks time, eight weeks time. There were really no studies that took place over a long period of time. Um, so um, in future, it could be investigated um, the long-term effects versus the short-term um, of music-based interve interventions as well as music therapy. There was also a great heterogeneity um, in study design. Um, some were observational, some were surveys, some were randomized control trials um, that included controls, but also some that didn't. Um, so because of the heterogeneity of the studies um, and also the interventions that were utilized, um, each study kind of utilized a different music intervention um, and also a music therapy intervention. Um, so it was a bit difficult to make generalizations um, given the heterogeneity. And in conclusion, the music therapy was used as an adjunct um, in all of the studies versus the main therapeutic input. So all the, all the individuals would continue treatment as usual and take on music therapy as an adjunct. Um, but because of this, it's hard to ascertain if the uh, effects from music therapy were purely for music therapy or also the effects of their treatment as usual with the adjunct of music therapy um, together. So there are some conclusions that we can make from the study though. Um, the perception of music in people with ASD has been shown to differ specifically in pitch um, and also music perception in comparison to neurotypical controls. And um, also individuals with autism spectrum disorder seem to have um, superior um, ability to um, kind of ascertain different pitches and recognize things in comparison to normal controls. Um, music and music therapy has also been shown to possibly prevent certain traits um, of autism during pre-birth, um, and it also has been shown to support the child-parent relationship and also movement coordination um, and also social communication as well. Um, it should be um, explored a bit more in depth if different samples should be investigated, specifically um, with age. Um, as I mentioned before, child-dominant samples um, were very heavily um, taken over by the 81 studies in comparison to adult studies. So it would be great um, in future to host more adult studies with ASD and music therapy um, and see if there's certain mediators that occur with age. Um, and that's the conclusion for this part of the presentation. You can see here this um, systematic review has been published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, and there's the DOI there. Um, I can also shift this around to the chat um, after the presentation's done. Um, but just to bring you now into the, the work I'm doing with my PhD, um, it's a small shift, um, but it still utilizes music, um, music therapy specifically for um, specific cultures um, and also exploring if there are cultural competent elements that come out of using different creative arts therapies for different groups. 
Um, this research is um, in conjunction with the NIHR as well. Um, I am associated with the Center, Center for Eudaimonia and Human Flourishing at the University of Oxford. Um, so I'd just like to take you through briefly what, I'll, what I do for my PhD. Um, so just a bit of background. Um, I'm not sure if, if anyone here is from the UK, so these are UK-based facts. Um, but racial and ethnic minority groups, um, specifically in the UK, are exposed to high levels of inequalities, specifically health inequalities. Um, in the UK, racial and ethnic minority groups, specifically Black racial minority groups, have higher rates of common mental disorders, severe mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia, psychosis, um, in comparison to other counterparts. And poor mental health outcomes have been um, have been shown in different service outcomes as well. So black racial minority groups have been shown to experience poor um, and adverse care pathways in comparison to white counterparts. Um, they're more likely to see, receive medication rather than psychological therapies and also report difficulties in accessing these services um, specifically that meet their culturally um, culturally relevant and informed needs. Um, different factors as well kind of uh, contribute to um, the reasons for these outcomes, specifically social exclusion, racial mistreatment and mental health services. Um, and that's been identified as discouraging um, black racial minority groups from engaging with these services. Um, so the background of the study is finding targeted treatments for black British people um, and seeing if creative arts therapies could be um, seen as therapeutic solutions in African and Caribbean populations. Talking therapies, specifically in the UK, um, comprise of CBT, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy, um, general um, psychological therapies, things of that nature. Um, and they have often posed the question of whether they are culturally relevant for, for different communities. Um, people from all communities have benefited from increased availability of evidence-based therapies, specifically talking therapies in the UK. However, in England, Black communities with mental health problems are currently less likely to access these therapies um, and also more likely to report negative experiences in therapies and poor outcomes. Um, recent data has shown that they often do not receive uh, achieve a full recovery um, and are less likely to complete treatments overall. So the rationale for my PhD is are um, different therapeutic solutions like creative arts therapies culturally competent and can they reduce the barriers to access care for disadvantaged groups? Um, creative arts therapy specifically are music therapy, visual arts, dance movement therapy, and also drama therapy. Um, many cultural anthropologists have argued that in African and Caribbean culture specifically, um, creative arts therapies play a, a role within that uh, society. Um, they also create a consciousness among their listeners and also create a important medium for maintaining their identity with their home country. So the research question, the overarching question are, is, are creative arts therapies viable and culturally competent treatment options in Black racial minority um, individuals suffering from psychiatric disorders? So my PhD take pl takes place in three phases. The first phase is a systematic review meta-analysis. Um, and this um, is specifically exploring the usage of creative arts therapies for adolescents and young people with symptoms of PTSD. Um, in the UK, 21% of um, individuals that are Black actually will experience symptoms of trauma and PTSD, which is quite a startling statistic. That's one in five. Um, so I honed in on PTSD for this meta-analysis. Um, there was a total of 26 studies with 2,100 participants. Um, the inclusion criteria included um, symptoms of trauma. Um, and also with the study design, PTSD had to be measured pre and post intervention. Um, what's really exciting about this meta-analysis is I did a subgroup analysis by ethnicity to explore if different ethnic groups um, actually had a, a better reduction in PTSD symptoms when um, a creative arts intervention, music, dance, et cetera, was utilized. Um, and the study um, has actually found that in studies specifically with homogenous Black samples, um, there was a larger effect in the reduction of trauma and PTSD symptoms 
um, when a creative arts intervention was utilized versus studies that included mixed samples or no black people in general. Um, this was pretty on target with the hypothesis, um, seeing as these individuals kind of engage with these um, arts based interventions already, even though they don't call them therapeutic. Um, so yeah, that was right on target with the proposed hypothesis. And to take it further in the second phase of the PhD, I'm focusing on a series of focus groups. Um, and the research question I'm asking are, what are the attitudes and opinions of Black racial minority young people, children and adolescents, and also cl clinicians about if uh, creative arts therapies are culturally competent treatment options, um, specifically for the improvement of well-being. So in this series of focus groups, um, I'm taking uh, 24 young people and 24 clinicians that work with them and asking these really important questions from different sites within London. Um, there's a North Central and East London site that I'm working with and also South London and Maudsley. Um, these are individuals that are already, already in services um, or currently on waiting lists. Um, and then also the clinicians that work with these individuals. And then asking these questions, um, specifically their opinions on creative arts therapies, um, if they currently use them at all, um, do they see any benefit with creative arts therapies, specifically, um, you know, perceived challenges that could come about with utilizing them. And kind of the main question of asking, you know, do you see them as culturally relevant for you? Do, do you see them as something that could be something that you would want to engage with? And is this something that you already, already utilize um, within your daily life, within your culture? Um, and this series of focus groups will take place in September of 2023. Um, within these focus groups, I will be coding for frequent themes that arise throughout the sessions that I have as far as the discussions um, and seeing um, if they actually believe that these would be therapeutic solutions that would benefit them. The final phase is actually taking this to an intervention, so the pilot study. Um, right now, I'm crafting an eight-week intervention that utilizes music therapy, dance movement therapy um, with young people aged 16 to 24 with symptoms of trauma and PTSD. Um, throughout the intervention, um, I will be tracing these symptoms, um, also symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, but in the intervention, they're actually community-based. Um, so East London Dance, I've partnered with, um, they will look at... Um, they will in, essentially engage with an eight week kind of choreographed um, design. Every two weeks, they will be learning a new dance. Um, throughout the, the eight weeks, um, again, I'll be tracing the symptoms of trauma every two weeks um, and seeing if there's any reduction, increase, things of that nature. Um, the second community-based organization is called Raw Sounds. They are in London and they are a community organization focusing on music and music therapy. Um, specifically with individuals from um, adverse um, kind of backgrounds and things of that nature. Um, so they'll be um, essentially engaging with these interventions over eight weeks and again, tracing if, you know, there's any reduction or, you know, benefit in mental well-being overall when these interventions are utilized. Um, that is all I had. Obviously, there will be questions um, that we will handle within the chat. But I thank you for listening. And again, great to great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vianna. This was really nice. Thanks for sharing your research with us. Um, yeah, it's really lovely to hear and also very inspiring, um, hopefully for other researchers um, that are uh, yeah in the same field or are trying to be. Um, it's really nice that studies are expanding because um, as you mentioned, it's like, um, the research is still limited. Um, yeah, and we'll go on to our last speaker, who's also a researcher. Um, and uh, we'll talk about her own practices. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, Supritha. I will um, just quickly introduce you. Um, Supritha is a researcher, lecturer, and therapist investigating the role of arts in enhancing communication and health. She investigated the contribution of dance movement psychotherapy towards the well being of children with an autism spectrum disorder and their caregivers. And she's currently working as a lecturer at Edge Hill University in England. She's teaching at the Department of Applied Health and Social Care in the Department of Creative Arts. Um, yeah, and I will just leave the floor to you, 
uh, thank you for joining and um, looking forward to listening. Thank you. Let me take a moment to share my screen. Am I audible and my slides are visible to you? Yes, it's perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you for having me today. And uh, I think this was a very good platform for me from the introduction and the two earlier presentations. I think I'm taking one step further from the uh, continuing work. They've answered, yes, it, uh, you know, uh, music and other forms of arts therapies can be beneficial to children, but I'm trying to understand why and how these factors can uh, be useful and what is happening there, what is the magic, what is behind the scene that is happening uh, that uh, that we can witness these changes and outcomes which uh, Brianna and uh, Katarina mentioned earlier. So um, uh, what I'm seeing here uh, is that my is an amalgamation of, uh, amalgamation of years of work, uh, probably from 2017 till now, I've brought different uh, uh, research studies and uh, different research designs together to build this presentation. So I'll go through different uh, facets of these uh, uh, processes and how this has come together. I've divided this into three different sections from what uh, Mansa gave the uh, questions as so uh, like uh, what can uh, arts bring to people and communities and how do people on the autism spectrum perceive and respond to this uh, you know intervention for arts I think this is one of the uh, major questions that stuck to me is just like wow most often we uh, focus on what others uh, perceive as an outcome or change from a perspective of a therapist or a parent or uh, an adult who is assessing from a, a different perspective but we do not hear the lived experience and how that feels to have that experience of uh, uh, you know uh, autism. Is it a disorder that we see or, or to be labeled or is it something uh, that is uh, one of the other ways of living? So how do we in, uh, you know, uh, make a, a environment that is inclusive and diverse enough to have that uh, neurodiversity to be accepted within the process? So can we use arts uh, uh, or arts therapies to expand those possibilities of communication? So communication is not just one way. So for me, it has to be two way uh, bilateral communication. So but when two directions are moving from one to another, there is an exchange of information. So how can we allow for that uh, a neurodivergent as well as neurotypical uh, individuals to exchange and be able to connect through the arts and how is that possible? So uh, for me, uh, this was the uh, starting place. Like I sat down and say, what can arts bring to people and communities? Well, I grew up in a, a community in a Southern India and it's a colorful, bright place, loud and, uh, you know, always with uh, surrounded by different forms of art. So for me, arts is not just music, dance, or uh, visual art as separate uh, identities. It's an integrated process where one informs the other and how these two, uh, you know, different modalities can, uh, in, you know, be part of the uh, intervention process. And uh, well. People have identified these uh, ages ago, and they have. It's been part of different cultures and different ways of, uh, uh, you know, uh, developing uh, one individual's identity. Uh, and this is something, uh, you know, art can bring people together. So that connection, how does it uh, make this connection possible, is something that was, uh, uh, you know curious to me, but which came across, when I came across this quote, I said, like, wow, loneliness is not the uh, absence of people. It's, uh, loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. So this is a, a, a popular quote from Carl Jung, who is one of the psycho pioneer of uh, psychoanalysis. And uh, uh, this 
quote is the touchstone for much of what we do in arts therapies. And it speaks to how creativity is uh, more than merely a pathway to health, but an intrinsic part of what it means to healthy human. So health is not absence of an illness, but it is how we can, uh, you know, bring this creativity as a pathway to merge and bring people together and uh, be able uh, to be heard, to be seen and to be felt. So this is the, uh, you know, in the context of autism and, uh, you know, this quote has a deeper meaning to me. So it has, um, you know, uh, especially when autism is seen with this hallmark differences in social interaction, behavior and preferences, often individuals uh, also have a unique sensory uh, sensitivity and experiences. So uh, how do we accept those differences and be able to uh, live or share those commonalities or differences in one's way of living? So what I saw was uh, the nature, the humans and the arts have you know, shared different uh, ways of uh, connections. And when we come down to the uh, root of what it might have been, so I see the space and time, uh, and the interaction of these through the body, a creative process that involves movement of a body within time and space can create magic through different uh, uh, exchange that can help in the process of understanding. And I think uh, this is uh, the very, you uh, know, primitive nature that we saw, like uh, arts can have that therapeutic or the healing, uh, you know, impact without even uh, using it in a way that is, uh, you know, as a therapy. So it just, uh, you know, arts therapies, how I see has um, evolved from that, uh, you know, utilizing that innate nature of uh, uh, the healing, therapeutic effects of arts and how that can be offered in a therapeutic process in a psychotherapy setting so that the emphasis is not on uh, uh, learning the uh, art form or development of skill. The emphasis is on the process of uh, being with the arts. So uh, it's not the art as the product uh, that comes out as, uh, you know, the artistic emphasis in our therapies, I see, uh, is the process that makes the difference in, uh, you know, the therapeutic exchange, interaction, and eventually, uh, you know, uh, enhancement of, uh, of one's growth and um, uh, elevation of uh, um, alleviation of certain. Uh, uh, physical, psychological, or social uh, challenges and difficulties. So uh, what I use arts therapies here is a collective term that uh, includes uh, or disciplines such as art psychotherapy, music therapy, drama therapy, dance movement therapy. And uh, uh, all these uh, you know, arts therapies which use uh, artistic medium for uh, therapeutic interaction and engagement. Although there are some crossovers and similarities, there are also distinct. Uh, they are also distinct in terms of their history, uh, their artistic preferences, uh, the mo uh, models uh, in which they practice, and. Uh, uh, when there was a uh, and I actually a research that was um, a systematic review that uh, Martina and colleagues conducted, where they identified uh, from around uh, eighty-seven uh, system uh, you know, articles that uh, you know there were some common elements across arts therapies that were uh, unique to uh, arts therapies intervention uh, that were not present in other types of uh, therapy like talking therapy or uh, uh, you know different types of um, uh, maybe physiotherapy, for instance. So how did they stand out from other therapies? These were the three uh, factors that they identified. Embodiment, that is the felt sense of being and sensing that experience. Concretization, that 
for, for example, how art can bring in, and I can see, I can express my emotion and see that through the colors, through the touch, or to, uh, through the movement that uh, can be exchanged, or the music making that gives us uh, you know, um, a process that, uh, an end product that I can hear through different sensory uh, inputs. So this unique uh, uh, aspect of the art was something, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, identified as a therapeutic factor that helped in the process of change. And uh, uh, when we identified uh, these uh, factors, there was also symbolism and metaphor. So symbolisms are something that can explain uh, beyond the mere representation through the word. So it can take us deeper from a spoken to unspoken way. So here is an example. I would like you to take a moment to notice the image uh, that is on the right hand side of the uh, slide here. So just take a moment and pause. So notice the colors, the texture, or perhaps, uh, you know, the aesthetics of this. This was for, uh, an image uh, drawn by a child who did not like to go to school. So, uh, but he was struggling. The, the school refusal was extreme, but uh, he could not, uh, uh, you know, tell what was happening or express, uh, you know, struggle to tell through words why he did not want to go to school. So, uh, it was an invitation for this child to share what was happening through playful way of uh, sharing. Okay. So you do not want to go to school, let's sit and play and what, see what happens there. And if you notice, uh, through this artwork created by this five-year-old child, uh, you know, in his own words, it's this rainbow who is caught up inside and unable to come out of its own. So if you uh, see the multicolored arc, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it looks like a colorful rainbow, but uh, there is a, a personified uh, form of rainbows. There are two dots uh, that are on top of these colorful arcs. And you can see a mouth-like structure uh, at the bottom. So it's a, uh, in, uh, you know, if I consider this as a lowering arc, so it's going uh, and uh, showing how I am feeling bright inside, possibly, but uh, it's difficult to share how uh, caught up I might be inside this uh, in a cloud that I'm uh, struggling to express. So uh, through verbal processing and dialoguing with the child, so this playful interaction brought out such uh, difficult uh, to express emotion without having to use words. I think that was the powerful moment for me. Yes, the nonverbal uh, aspect of uh, the arts is something that makes it much more easier to connect and uh, be able to share and see how we can uh, utilize uh, or breach uh, the need of uh, you know, verbalizing or cognitively thinking of what it is before uh, having to you know, uh, feel and express what that emotion might have been. So uh, this is um, uh, from here, we uh, you know, started working on a large book uh, through Rotlet publication. And we have around 14 research-based chapters uh, with contributors from uh, um, uh, 31, uh, 31 authors and uh, do, uh, focusing on different types of research methods, research outcomes and therapeutic processes and critiques of both uh, existing practice and research methodologies in arts therapies. And I would like to bring three different uh, uh, snippets of chapters which bring the voice of lived experience of what it means and why do people like that's the second question why do people uh, you know uh, want to uh, you know engage in arts therapies and this is a story uh, from uh, 
a year long drama therapy that was carried out in mainstream school this was an autistic girl which is unusual like considering the prevalence and incidence which brianna uh, the disparity between males and females which she explained earlier uh, but we wanted to see how uh, you know, being a girl, uh, they talk about masking and camouflaging. Like, yes, I cannot, I am uh, able to hide with my own mask and uh, still be able to struggle from within. Uh, uh, but uh, working initially by herself, in drama therapy, we start uh, the author. Uh, they started working with the child uh, in one-to-one -one basis, and they wanted to uh, explore what this friendship means, the art of friendship. How do I connect uh, with the other? And uh, uh, it, uh, through reflections, they use different uh, ways of connecting and processing what friendship meant to the child and uh, at the heart of the work was the reciprocity of friendship and towards the end of this uh, one year uh, session she chose to use the aspects of the game called pokemon which is very popular i think uh, uh, in cartoon and children love it and uh, that supported her to gradually understand the two-way process of social interaction with this realization towards and she requested on her own that her uh, desire was to integrate into a, a friendship group dance uh, and drama therapy. So it was from one to one therapy, she wanted uh, voluntarily uh, ask for a group drama therapy process. So she came up with a recipe of what it means to cherish and develop uh, the art of friendship. And she had, uh, you can see those images uh, that are uh, narrated next to the uh, uh, verb that. Uh, you know, talks about how uh, different types of nourishment, uh, symbolic and metaphoric meaning that I was sharing earlier, can be brought through these processes of uh, connecting and understanding abstract concepts, which might be difficult to, uh, you know, articulate. This is another example from uh, uh, a drama therapy group again based in the UK. Uh, they're called the Roundabout uh, 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 the company. They uh, work with uh, uh, you know a long term. Uh, uh, intervention in two different uh, special education needs settings. So it was a group drama therapy process. And uh, you can see how children have expressed uh, their experience of uh, you know, taking part in drama therapy, what it felt. They used some uh, something called emotion stones. So these emotion stones were uh, specifically uh, uh, relate to uh, the concretization aspect or the therapeutic factor, which I was mentioning earlier. So how I can see and feel and touch and externalize that uh, experience without uh, uh, you know, harming oneself or the other in the process of uh, uh, understanding and connecting. So they were able to identify uh, different emotion stones and also be able to uh, embody and share those with animated experience. And uh, one of the girls uh, uh, said, it's like a drama and everything. It's so much fun. It's like type of act. I'm acting out things. It makes you feel happy. You can show emotions and it's fun, you can talk uh, stuff out. So you can see how uh, children are expressing, uh, you know, uh, these uh, experience of what drama therapy meant to them. Uh, this is another interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, you know, chapter, one of the chapters in the book, uh, which we are, uh, you know, uh, in the production phase. Uh, and, um, this is like a unique uh, uh, chapter, which is uh, using a heuristic narrative uh, research methodology. And this is written by uh, an art therapist uh, where uh, there is a narrative exploration with the therapist, uh, the, uh, the client, 
and the mother of the client from recalling uh, like uh, after the uh, five years of uh, completing therapy. So they are revisiting the experiences of what art therapy meant to them. And uh, uh, through the, uh, you know, uh, construction from this uh, creative synthesis, the author came up with, um, you know, uh, this poem, which she talks about what is that really helped them, uh, you know, what was that magic within our therapy that helped them. So uh, uh, this poem reads, uh, and sometimes the help is in the silence. There is between us some closeness, Receiving gets easier through our alliance, and sometimes help is in the words. They float from mouth and now heard. A wordless connection, he cares, he's there. And sometimes the help comes in the making. Two artists are meeting, he understood, and I felt different. So you see and hear how the individual unique uh, uh, uniqueness and identities are explored and uh, they bring in that uh, you know understanding of what it is through the process of art making and knowing each other. And these creative connections that connect and uh, uh, create, let me see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Leads to the third final question of uh, can we use arts? Uh, yes, we can connect. Can we use that for communication and, uh, and more expand our possibilities of communication? And this was the image made by another child. Uh, we were looking at colorful hatchlings. And this is like uh, different factors, again, what I described earlier on uh, therapeutic attunement. So there is a tune, uh, I think Katharina mentioned earlier, okay, towards the end, we were in same rhythm. I could uh, you know, connect with the child. The mother who, uh, you know, she related about uh, spoke, okay, uh, I can uh, use that time for us. So us time, what was that? What was happening there? So there is something called attunement. So I can tune with the other body. So two bodies with, are coming together without, uh, you know, necessarily the physical contact. There is something that is connecting between the two. And that uh, attunement and process of mirroring uh, that can uh, that was something uh, identified uh, in the systematic review uh, that I conducted as part of uh, the first phase of the intervention development, and I identified different uh, uh, you know uh, therapeutic processes that were key and important uh, in, uh, in uh, different uh, research studies that were specifically from dance movement psychotherapy. And uh, using those um, uh, key factors and therapeutic principles, we developed an intervention protocol and something uh, I think it's uh, what uh, Brianna is uh, you know, planning to do ahead. So it's, uh, it was similar process of developing an intervention protocol, identifying the key therapeutic factors and how they can be utilized in an eclectic way to uh, adapt and tailor it to the needs of the group of the children that we were working with. And uh, uh, we used a mixed methods crossover research design and we gathered uh, you know, understanding from different perspectives. And uh, quantitative research was conducted from parents and teachers perspective. Qualitative research was from therapists and participants perspective. And our space research process, I, what I described later on, is an artistic inquiry process that I, as a researcher, was involved, uh, you know, felt and experienced what was it for, uh, you know, being in that therapeutic environment, how uh, that uh, that really dialogue, uh, I call it, uh, you know, uh, you know, a dialogue between the therapist and uh, the clients that was happening, uh, you know, organically, uh, and uh, how it developed over time. And this quantitative results uh, like, uh, was um, gathered through two questionnaires, social communication questionnaire and strength and difficulties questionnaire. And uh, 
towards the end of the, so there was an experimental group and a control group, and there was a decrement uh, uh, in the uh, you know difficulties uh, that the children were focused, uh, you know, experiencing, but it was not uh, statistically significant though. Uh, but uh, especially the social and communication was something that uh, established a statistical significance and uh, significance and the effect size was uh, uh, much more meaningful in a therapeutic uh, process and identifying the change in the children. And uh, what was something uh, interesting was uh, uh, we had a heterogeneous group of children who were uh, choosing or or preferred more was verbal communication or nonverbal communication. Regardless of their preference of verbal or nonverbal, there was an increment in uh, social and communication, uh, you know, scores that was measured uh, and compared between the two groups. And finally, uh, here comes a vivid social web. And through this uh, you know, intervention process, we created such an interaction and uh, all the pro therapeutic process was so uh, um, uh, difficult. I wouldn't say it was an easy process. It was so challenging to bring uh, different um, individuals and children together in a therapeutic space and hold that space for different emotional needs and meeting them uh, from where they were. However, through the process of, uh, um, you know, 10 weeks of, uh, I'm sorry, eight weeks of intervention, uh, uh, 10 weeks of intervention and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, five different groups of uh, children, uh, this was something, uh, 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 an artistic response or embodied artistic inquiry. One of the research methods, uh, so, uh, very unpopular in the uh, health sciences, but something that is, um, I would say, inherently uh, part of creative arts therapies uh, was something uh, uh, utilized for uh, gathering the uh, to draw upon self experiences and embodied experience of the therapeutic process. And uh, let me share a video, a short video, very quickly, but before which I will give a synopsis of uh, what that means uh, before I play. Can I check with Mans? Uh, how, how long do we have? Uh, um, am I running over time? Or? Yeah, it's okay. You have a few more minutes, um, okay. like five. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just give a brief, uh, uh, you know, a background of this and then uh, play the video and we'll end, uh, end at that point. So uh, this video, as you see, describes uh, the therapeutic process from my embodied experience. Uh, the dance uh, vocabulary that I have used is something called Bharatanatyam. I was trained in Bharatanatyam. It's one of the dance forms of southern parts of India. And it uses a lot of um, a narrative process of uh, telling a story. And uh, hand gestures, movements are used for bringing different uh, aspects of uh, uh, therapeutic experiences. And uh, I begin with uh, you know, exploring uh, how is it to enter a different a space and connect with uh, children who are new to the uh, environment. For me, uh, I noticed that there are different bubbles, bubbles within the bubbles revolving around themselves. So I was not able to enter through or connect because the bubbles were so closed uh, at the beginning. And uh, there were uh, uh, to, you know, so many significant moments during the therapeutic process. One was something that we identified as uncertainty to certainty. So the uh, children were able to express certain decisions assertively and uh, uh, they were like initially like unsure of what direction of the movement to take, but there was a shift from uh, moving in, uh, you know, wide uh, possibilities of directions to, yes, uh, a certain assertive firmness in the process. There was another uh, key moment of uh, change that we noticed was chaos 
to stillness. So this was not something, uh, uh, you know, luxuriously available. There was so much of things happening during the therapeutic process and uh, chaotic moments everywhere. Uh, so it was uh, difficult to see a group as one group because there were so many individuals uh, in a group, but it did not feel as one group. So uh, there were instances where there were quiet and relaxed moments after chaotic situations. And another therapeutic factor uh, or a change, a significant moment was fear to courage. So these were the moments where uh, children were able to overcome certain hesitations and inhibitions to engage in the session. So they stepped out of that uh, their own bubble and they were able to share something. And the final uh, moment was uh, being tensed uh, to the tenderness. So there was a, a glimpse of these children that they you know, held uh, for themselves, perhaps where uh, I was, you know, I would say uh, perhaps fortunate to be able to witness those moments of tenderness and be able to connect with them. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the last factor, let me share my screen. is a reputation to reciprocity. So from different uh, um, mimicking movements, suddenly there was a synchrony, a dance of a seesaw, of a, a dialogue that began. And uh, those were uh, uh, something colorful, unique to each individual in the group, but created a, a, you know, a web-like image. And therefore, I call this uh, synthesis as a vivid uh, uh, web of social connections. And see if my screen can happen now with the video. Here we go. So let's stop at this point and share my last slide. And this is what I would like to end with. So arts are something uh, that uh, do not need to cure to be able to heal. And it's the 
a way they can help us curate our lives. So creative art therapies may, uh, you know, indeed reduce certain symptoms that are measurable aspect of autism, but that is not the um, complete value or the real value there. They allow us to reconnect with ourselves, with each other and the world around us uh, in a way that is personally authentic, and also communally beneficial. So this is a, you know, a phrase that I have taken from uh, uh, Christopher Bailey's uh, 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 preface that he has written for us, uh, for our book uh, in the uh, upcoming publication. These are some of the references and thank you for uh, being with us tonight and any questions that I think can be open for all three speakers and happy to take. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Supritha, for um, showing us your experience, also sharing the experiences of uh, children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and yeah, giving a lot of power to that. Um, it was really beautiful. And um, yeah, maybe before I forget, um, also, if you don't mind other speakers to, um, if people have questions, if they can contact you via email, you can maybe put it in the chat. Um, also, um, if people want to rewatch the video that you sent, uh, Supritha, maybe you can also uh, put that in the chat. Um, so yeah, so that uh, people can uh, look at the whole thing. Uh, is this really wonderful? Um, yeah, and um, also I had uh, some questions in the Q&A um, that I will now just address to all of you that we can maybe start this discussion with something very pragmatic, just um, how would you, what would you advise to people that, uh, for example, don't have access to certified uh, art therapists, music therapists, or dance therapists, or um, how can people our caregivers of uh, people with autism spectrum disorder, people that are have it themselves, how can they use it at home? Um, and for example, how uh, could people use it that are in the education? Um, how can educators use uh, arts in, in this way uh, where they don't have the certified um, access to certified uh, therapy? Uh, also, if you don't, um, have any experiences with this, but have read anything about it, you can also uh, feel free to share. I think people were, um, yeah, people have been asking for this. So this would be a uh, good help. Yeah. Whoever wants to um, start answering it can go, it's, uh, can open. So if I can signpost to certain uh, associations and, uh, and list of uh, available therapists they can uh, possibly benefit so uh, European Association of uh, Creative Arts Therapies and Education is somewhere uh, a carta I don't know let, let me put the um, link once I finish talking I'll find the links and put them yeah. in the chat box but uh, that's an association where you can find a list of registered therapists and now that I think post-COVID things have uh, moved from uh, being confined one place to uh, you know digital space and it has uh, you know changed or shifted the concept of accessibility and how that can be made more um, suitable for uh, you know uh, connecting with uh, different people uh, through um, digital uh, mode and I think this is one of our products of uh, uh, you know that technology advancement uh, that has brought us here. Uh, that could be one process, uh, that first thought that came to my mind. The second aspect was uh, considering, uh, you know, the innate nature of the arts. So I remember, I still do recall the lullabies sung by my mother and how she was, uh, you know, the moment of uh, swaying that accompanied those lullabies, the stories that uh, we uh, created, imagined, and uh, played through the uh, you know uh, uh, 
interaction that was happening there. So community arts is something uh, uh, that can bring certain uh, processes, uh, you know, uh, that can uh, uh, that may not be a uh, um, therapy as such, but can still have certain therapeutic uh, benefits uh, that can be uh, uh, useful for uh, 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 accessing in a way that is uh, not restricted. Yeah, thank you. Um, Brianna, do you maybe want to add something? I don't have too much on that, actually. I was looking at one of the Q&A questions concerning the underlying mechanisms of why music would be beneficial. Um, and I wanted to speak to that um, a bit more. But as far as this question, I think okay. I'll hand it over to Katerina. <laughs> sure. Katerina, do you have any tips for parents or people in education, how they can um, integrate music in their, uh, either in the daily life or what would you suggest? I don't know. Uh, just to try everything, to, to listen to music, uh, to interact with music, to, to sing. If you, if you have some instruments uh, to play, to try to communicate through music, to dance, that's something that we can um, put in our lives. Mm -hmm. Everyone can do it. Everyone can vocalize. So let's start with that, and then we'll yeah. see. Yeah, <laughs> great. Um, yeah. So just try anything. That's the yeah. And uh, one other um, aspect that I would like to highlight is how can we observe and notice. So it's not always about uh, responding to what the child is doing, maybe allowing ourselves to follow the lead of the child. So the child can bring so many aspects. They have, you know, abundant of uh, uh, energy and they bring uh, you know, music that we might not be able to uh, you know, understand, but allowing ourselves to be able to follow them, follow their lead and meet where they are, that can be the starting point of the connection. So I might not need the skill of the music, uh, you know, um, expertise as such, but I, uh, there is, uh, you know, rhythm in uh, how I speak, there is a rhythm in how I move, there is even rhythm in the heart it. So there is like innate biological rhythm that I can connect. So it can go as wide and as uh, simple as that. So if you start reducing to the simplicity of, um, you know, different art forms, it comes to the natural primitive ways of communicating. So uh, how can I listen to those aspects of what the child is communicating and respond to that? And that becomes an interaction from uh, for us to start as a caregiver. Uh, it could be educational setting or it could be uh, at home. So this could be one of the foremost principles, as I would say, uh, that could help us uh, attune uh, to, uh, between bodies. Yeah, and also maybe connected to this, have you ever, um, you or either Katarina in your practice working with uh, children with ASD, have you also used uh, any artistic practices to kind of identify their specific sensory um, specialties or sensitivities um, that are specific to that child? Or has that been done? I don't know if I, I understand quite, but... Um, um... More like just if not, not in order using arts or like communication through music, not in order to uh, change anything or heal or uh, just, but just in order to understand um, how this not neurotypical child understands the world, for example. Uh, yes, that's important uh, because if you want to communicate with the child, you, um, you should understand uh, him, she, and uh, so you observe, you listen, you, you're, sometimes you're not a teacher, but you're a student. <laughs> 
you're learning from from them and uh, then you can understand um i don't know i from from playing sometimes um, one my, of my students also um draw something mm -hmm. music was not the best but um yes understanding observing that's Do you also notice that there's uh, children with different uh, levels of sensitivity? Maybe they respond differently to different uh, loudness of music or um, things like this? Uh, yes, also. I know that um, um, loud music and, and upbeat is not for every, every, every child with autism. So if they have uh, some other um how can i say um um disorders or something like that that is stronger they don't like loud music they everything is is too loud for them so if i played um too fast or aggressive in, on piano they were like no 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 stop stop um so it is different from child to child but I also have this student that um, likes loud, loud music. It was uh, for me it was a surprise because it was loud and uh, and uh, heavy and and the rhythm was um, was fast. This was something new. So it is different uh, from from every specter. So yeah, and I think it's maybe. Um, or from what I understand of um, your work is also this aspect uh, of arts that allow playfulness. I think also Supreta mentioned this, um, where we can uh, test out different things in a very, um, yeah, in a very playful way and just learn about each other um, in this way that is not, it's not very strict and allows for variability and allows for these kind of discoveries. Yeah, and maybe here it's also like a good moment to uh, to talk, um, yeah, address the question of what specifically is this cause that um, that uh, underlies um, why is music helpful? Or why what do art therapies in general add um, to for for any kind of um, supporting people with ASD or other people? Yeah, maybe Brianna, do you wanna? Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I spoke about in the, the systematic re review results, um, there was great increases within social communication, um, social interactions as an individual, but also in group settings. Um, but as far as the biological mechanisms, there were a few papers within the systematic review that we found that different brain circuits and brain areas that function relating to um, verbal language. Um, there were more um, kind of synapses firing when it came to the understanding of music, um, when it came to people with autism versus those that had that, that were neurotypical, essentially. Um, so this is the Wernicke's area in the brain, which is the understanding of language. Um, this is actually a bit switched off in individuals with ASD. Um, but those, in the, those areas of the brain that um, relate more with music, like the temporal lobe, um, things of that nature, it actually seemed to be a bit more intact with individuals with ASD. Um, and again, that was a small aside within the paper. I think it was around three papers that were cited, um, but they did kind of highlight that biological mechanism that's happening um, on the neurological level. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, in general, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, they relate a bit more um, with music than neurotypical controls or things of that nature. Um, but I think it should be explored a bit more why that is. Obviously, we see now the effects of these things, um, but to get um, kind of past the, the neurological level would be, I think, the next steps. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting that there are differences in processing. And then this would also imply that um, for individuals with ASD who have issues with communication uh, using music, um, or inter integrating music in communication can can really aid right um, this cause, um, and this is maybe beyond um, also what Suprita was talking about uh, with arts providing um, 
a form of nonverbal communication that is kind of universal. Um, and yeah, hence uh, really beautiful. Um, yeah, do you um, also maybe want to talk about why you chose dance therapy for the, um, for example, like as a, because it also has some communication aspects, right? Uh, why you chose it for your upcoming study, maybe? Right, so um, dance movement therapy has a lot of the same benefits that music therapy does, um, you know, in incorporating kind of group dynamics that kind of go awry with different psychiatric disorders, um, kind of allowing individuals to be immersed in group settings, but also within social communication settings as well. Um, so the population I'm looking at is specifically individuals with PTSD. Um, and there's large aspects of withdrawal when certain symptoms or, you know, certain traumatic events occur. Um, so it's really nice to utilize dance movement therapy because you're integrating within a group, um, but you're also use, utilizing um, a lot of movement and, you know, your body and, and communicating things that you can't necessarily say verbally. Um, and as I was saying, the, the cultural context of, of dance within Black communities um, is very strong and it's kind of been highlighted throughout centuries, essentially. Um, so utilizing something that's already, you know, used um, within the population just seems like second nature, um, you know, utilize a dance movement intervention and also a music intervention um, to kind of see if these symptoms could be alleviated a bit better. Um, than the treatment as usual that they they currently have ongoing. Right, yeah. Um, okay, do, Suprita, do you also maybe wanna add to this, uh, being a dance movement therapist, what, um, what kind of um, population or what kind of features of um, ASD, because there have there are definitely different um, types of ASD. Um, what kind of features do you think dance movement therapy is most, what kind of people mo would most benefit from it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I uh, you know, recalled one of the articles uh, on dance movement therapy and sensory uh, needs of children. So there were four different categories that were identified. One was hypersensitivity, then hyposensitivity. So there is, uh, you know, either overreaction or underreaction to it. And uh, sensory seeking, where, uh, you know, uh, the experience is more about uh, needing that um, uh, sensory um, uh, exposure or sensory avoidance. So these were four different uh, patterns that came up in this research article by Jackie Edwards. And uh, she talks about how she utilized different aspects of uh, uh, setting up the space using different types of materials and objects that can be used as transitional objects and also uh, that can be tactile and be useful for uh, movements that can uh, be uh, used for uh, mode of uh, expression. So this becomes an, uh, uh, these objects and uh, props, what we call in dance movement therapy, can become an extension of the body that can help us connect through these uh, different ways of uh, um, uh, utilizing the props. So uh, thinking of the space, the distance, the direction, and uh, coming back to uh, one's own body. So what Brianna was uh, sharing earlier, so like, it is uh, through the body we connect, uh, uh, there is an uh, interaction of body and the mind. So uh, if I uh, you know, start opening up my arms and start moving, I can, uh, you know, in, in, in eventually impact on my mind and how I feel and also in out so it's not necessarily from outside in but it can also bring that inside out through you know how I'm feeling and uh, might reflect on how I pose uh, put my body how I uh, share my uh, you know, space with others and how I interact with others. So those might not necessarily be a behavioral issue uh, or from the child. It could be a, 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 an aspect of the communication, but can we listen to those aspects, how the child is expressing through those uh, sensory seeking or avoidance or sensitivity and how we can connect 
through those aspects of utilizing our own bodies as the instrument. So body becomes the musical instrument. So I play music through my body and connect through kinesthetic empathy. So that is the connection that can bring um, uh, one uh, person. Like I can feel how the child might be feeling through a mirroring that movement in my own actions and living for that moment. So that's yeah. the connection. Yeah. So do I understand correctly that uh, it's specifically for um, uh, people that uh, either respond with, um, respond very much or not a lot to some sensory stimuli that this is where dance can come uh, into play because overreaction or underreaction can be um, kind of a symptom of uh, disconnection uh, or some way of not being able to relate to your or your inner self with the environment kind of. So it could be for different reasons. I do not know the cause or uh, mm -hmm. but uh, what we can see as uh, hypersensitivity or uh, hyposensitivity or uh, sensory seeking or avoidance can be for different reasons. But uh, there might be something deeper uh, from a, uh, you know, a psychological perspective what child might be experiencing at that point, listening to those aspects and uh, being uh, creative in a way that we use our own uh, materials around how we use, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, certain examples uh, which I can uh, you know, possibly give. So uh, I might have very uh, registration. Like if I'm, um, uh, if I have a sensory tactile uh, as uh, seeking, uh, if I'm seeking sensory uh, uh, seeking sensory needs uh, through tactile processes, uh, I might bring in uh, different uh, uh, sensory balls or materials uh, like we use a lot of um, garments and different types of materials that have different textures in uh, movement uh, dance movement therapy session so that can uh, possibly um, what do you say invite the participant to explore different ways of moving and uh, different ways of being. So I can uh, experiment through these safe ways of holding the movements in a different way that could possibly integrate into my own vocabulary further. So I might have certain restricted vocabulary, but through this, uh, you know, safe ways of exploring, they can bring in uh, different ways of, uh, mm, uh, or new ways of uh, being uh, towards the end of the mm, ex uh, safe experimentation those prompts. Yeah, right. Maybe this also, um, yeah, thank you for also giving examples. Um, it's really helpful. Maybe this also, in part could answer uh, one of the questions that we have in the q and I will read now in case anyone has something to add. Uh, Sanya is working with children with autism um, and sometimes they would get stuck on a certain song and it would turn into a small temporary obsession. Um, so she's asking for suggestions on how to break the cycle but stay within music mode. Anybody would like to go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, one of the key aspects what I have here is um, I don't know people might be familiar with improvisation uh, technique uh, in uh, music. So um, it's something that uh, children have that uh, you know particular uh, you know obsession to particular uh, rhythm or a movement or something. So what I would generally start with uh, uh, the same um, example from one of the um, uh, sessions, I could say, uh, it's a similar thing. The child uh, used to build blocks 
constantly. So similar to music, this was block building in the session. So any object that I uh, that we use in dance therapy, it was an uh, arrangement of these uh, you know different blocks uh, in straight lines. So it was only about uh, uh, building blocks vertically or horizontally on the floor. So uh, I think it's similar uh, with a music track that they need only that particular um, uh, you know, element. Uh, it might be challenging in a group process, but if you're thinking of one-to-one -one process, uh, that could be the possibly the starting point where you can uh, build that connection of, uh, yes, uh, so here I am connecting with one straight line to another and su subtle changes. So there might be different aspects. Uh, if I uh, describe a movement, uh, if you are familiar with um, uh, movement annotation and um, Laban movement analysis, uh, they talk about different effort uh, factors. So uh, one would be the direction, uh, the other could be the weight of the body or uh, the timing in which the process is. So, uh, so there are four factors that would come in. So the weight, the direction, the space, uh, and uh, the use of, um, uh, you know, what do you say? Mm. One, two, three, and the, yeah, uh, how one of the factors can be possibly shifted uh, in the uh, action drive and how that can be uh, still connected through the um, three different other elements, uh, which might be constant. For example, uh, if I take uh, a movement uh, that is uh, the child is repeating. So it is one, two, three, four, whatever I do, this is the movement. So what I see here is, okay, uh, the weight is strong. So it is bound movement, it is tight. And uh, there is a direction which is straight. So I would start with the same movement, uh, but perhaps now speed uh, change, uh, keep the other factors constant and shift the factor of time. Uh, so uh, if the child is uh, doing this, I might start doing slower mm, or faster. So I did not change the movement. I'm uh, uh, keeping the direction of the movement similar. I'm keeping the boundness of the di uh, you know, movement similar. I'm, keep I'm only changing one aspect that is time. So uh, uh, that is uh, the starting point for improvisation. So I would over exaggerate or under exaggerate a certain movement. So I might increase the speed or decrease the speed, or I might uh, make this loud uh, and bigger or smaller. Uh, and then from the direction, it's the same movement, I'm playing with a different direction. So these are some of the factors. It's the same movement, but it's the uh, quality of the movement that I'm subtle shift, uh, making subtle shifts that can perhaps uh, allow for that consistency, but uh, you know, expanding the vocabulary uh, in the same process. I think this can apply to music as well. So the example came from movement. That's my first vocabulary. But in music, uh, the uh, concept of rhythm, the time, the space, uh, uh, the use of uh, intonation, the stress, uh, the uh, pitch. So this is, these are the factors that can be possibly played with and uh, uh, allow for uh, improvisation in the process of connecting and also being consistent in uh, the way the child prefers to. So in that way, we are increasing this uh, vocabulary and comfort of a zone of the child gradually. Yeah, this is a really good example. Maybe Katarina, do you also want to explain how do you, um, when you improvise on a song, how do you um, ask the, the children uh, or like invite them into improvisation? Um, 
because I think it's not um, usually we in music school, we learn a song and then that's it. Um, but to improvise on a theme can maybe seem very difficult, but it's it seems very important. And for example, in this question, also something desirable um, to try to change some factors. How do you achieve this? Um, sometimes it's hard, but sometimes um, um, students with uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, like uh, Suprita said, um, one, um, they they like uh, like uh, they like um, small changes. So with one student, we play with different tonalities. If he uh, hear hear that, so then we play one team um, in uh, high uh, high um, sound and then uh, low and like that. I don't know in different keys. Then I. Uh, ask them to play it faster, to play it slower, uh, and maybe I play as a question in the same notes, but in different, um, uh, they, they, they are kind of mixed, so that the same notes, but differently playing. So, and I ask to answer and waiting and I don't know it's it's slowly it's it's slow um it takes some time so maybe yeah. at first if it is changed by just by um tempo so it is uh, faster or slower for first time it's okay and then they uh, add something um some melodical or harmonical um aspect or or just rhythmical and it's okay for for starter, but then, in my experience, they they when they start, they uh, like it really much, and they uh, want to play. I had one student that wanted to play in every tonality. Uh, he knows this uh, team, and um, he wouldn't stop until they didn't. Uh, he didn't uh, play in just just every tonality we know. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And also maybe just um, um, thank you for both for giving these examples. And um, I'm sure people will find it useful. Um, maybe as one last question before we wrap up also to you, Katarina, uh, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, if learning the piano is something that's possible also for nonverbal children. And I think you have also experience with uh, with this, right? Um, yes, I also had one one boy and one also girl um, who didn't speak, uh, but it, it is hard. You don't, don't use letters and, uh, and numbers, but you um, have to find um, where is um, their respond of music. If they uh, listen, how they listen, how they respond, maybe there, there are chords, maybe they're just, just music, just, um, to repeat some sounds at first, maybe written at first, and then then you work with that um, progress. It's it's harder. It's it's um, maybe it's not. Um, it's like step by step, really small steps, but you can find it. But first, you can you you have to find uh, if how and uh, if response uh, on, on music if that's for him or she or her so um they try maybe just to repeat maybe to show if mm. he's visually maybe better yeah. we try to i i played and they i show exactly how to move with hands and uh, i marked the keys and like that so it you you have to find a way, but it's not like that that you learn every song you want. So, but but just to play to 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 communicate your music does not just he he can play Bach or Mozart or Beethoven. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing um, your your expertise and. Um, yeah, I think at this point, um, maybe I will wrap up with, um, yeah, just um, major thanks to all of you um, for making this possible. I also find it um, very 
uh, a very rich experience to have experts from different fields uh, join in seminars like this. Um, and that's how we maybe progress in each of our fields best. Um, uh, so yes, I'm very happy that uh, you were all part of this. I really thank you for your time and sharing all of this with us. And thank you all the um, listeners for coming as well.